This program, while curated to help you improve your health, contains general advice and should not replace the individual advice of your medical practitioner. The pill is chemical castration. There's really no other way to look at it. Contraceptive drugs rob women of their own hormone. Your period can be a handy gauge because ovulation will be the first thing to switch off with under eating. You can get around the problem of a thickened uterine lining by ovulating and making progesterone. We have this crazy narrative in our society that periods are a liability somehow, you know, that they're difficult and that just goes with the territory. And of course, that's not true at all. The menstrual cycle can be a strength. In life, it's normal to have ups and downs. But what do we do when we get stuck? I've always been fascinated by the healing journey. Why do some people get better while others fail to make the shift? Welcome to the Season 2 Expert Series, where you'll meet 24 of the world's leaders in health, discussing their passions and what it takes to make a shift. We tend to be our, our harshest critics. We are more than the muscle and bones in our body. Whoa, that's so opposite of what I was taught growing up. I would like a call to arms for women to know that their intuition isn't lying to them. I'm Catherine Maslin, and this is The Shift. Hi, I'm Catherine Maslin, naturopath, author, and host of The Shift. In the expert series, we share the insight stories and expertise of each of our amazing experts. We're talking doctors, authors, naturopaths, researchers, and thought leaders. You may have heard them on season two of The Shift, where we took snippets of these interviews to put them together in the series for you. If you haven't listened to season two yet, I'd highly recommend checking out episode one, which will give you an overview of what constitutes women's hormonal health and a sneak peek into the series. We'll provide a link in the show notes. In this episode of The Shift, we have Lara Bryden. Also known as the period revolutionary, Lara is a naturopathic doctor with over 25 years experience. She is the author of the best-selling books, Period Repair Manual and Hormone Repair Manual. She is a wealth of knowledge on all things hormones and a regular media commentator and international speaker. With a strong science background, Lara sits on several advisory boards and has published two peer-reviewed papers on polycystic ovarian syndrome. Lara has her finger on the pulse on the latest research in hormones and women's health, and I always learn something from her. She's a regular lecturer and support to other naturopaths and doctors and has been championing the fight for real and accurate information when it comes to women's health. Get your notebooks ready because there is a lot of value in this episode. Let's get stuck right in. Lara Bryden, thank you so much for joining me on season two of The Shift. I'm really excited to learn all about your expertise. You're a bit of a micro celebrity amongst us naturopaths in the area of women's health and hormones. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. So I want to go straight in really and ask you why periods and women's health? What made you delve into this area so deeply? It all started with my patients. I've been a naturopath naturopathic doctor for 25 years. And over most of those years, it's been women coming to see me for all sorts of period problems, PCOS, endometriosis, perimenopause. And just over the decades, I was able to really get a feel for what works and doesn't work for periods. And then of course, at a certain point, I decided I need to share this information with as many women as possible and raise the bar of expectation as to what period health should be, because we have this crazy narrative in our society that periods are a liability somehow, you know, that they're difficult and that just goes with the territory. And of course, that's not true at all. The menstrual cycle can be a strength. Tell me, how can it be a strength to women? I know it's sort of diving straight in, but I'm really curious. Tell me how. Because ovulatory menstrual cycles, a menstrual cycle in which ovulation is the main event, is how women make hormones. We need to ovulate every month because that's how we make estrogen and progesterone, which we need for general health, not just to make a baby. I mean, the other way to make those hormones, of course, is with a pregnancy. But in our modern world, most of us are not going to have 10 pregnancies through our life. Instead, we're going to have about 400 periods on average, 400 monthly cycles of making hormones. 
And with those hormones, we're building up metabolic reserve. So each and every ovulatory cycle, each and every dose of estrogen and progesterone builds health. It builds bone density. It builds cardiovascular health. It builds brain health. It's good for mood. I think of it like each and every ovulatory cycle is like a deposit into the bank account of long-term health that we can then draw on for the rest of our lives, even after menopause and we stop having menstrual cycles. What are some of the other impacts more in the moment of ovulation not happening for a woman? Well, I guess the first thing to think about is that the hormone we make after ovulation, progesterone, is what we need to maintain a healthy uterine lining. So one of the problems with chronically not ovulating, if you're not on contraceptive drugs to deal with that situation, is that you can build up a thickened uterine lining. And so That's common with PCOS, for example. And that's one of the reasons why if women aren't ovulating regularly and having a regular menstrual cycle bleed, then they can tend to a thickened uterine lining. And that's one of the arguments for using contraceptive drugs. But you can get around the problem of a thickened uterine lining by ovulating and making progesterone. And that progesterone helps to promote the normal, healthy shedding of the uterine lining. In contrast, anovulatory cycles are really quite common. They're a main key feature of PCOS, but they can happen in other situations as well, including perimenopause. And some of the downstream effects of an anovulatory cycle or a cycle where ovulation did not happen is there can be unusual bleeding. So bleeding that goes on too long, bleeding that is irregular, erratic. A lot of that, the time that gets referred to as a situation of estrogen dominance or hormone imbalance. But through my lens, I think it's important to use the term anovulatory cycle because that really is more precise in terms of what is the problem. Problem being ovulation did not occur. The problem being in that case, you make estrogen, but no progesterone to balance it. So I guess at this point, it's probably good to have a conversation of what does a healthy menstrual cycle look like and what are the hormonal dynamics that are occurring during that cycle? Would you mind talking a little bit to that? Yeah, of course. So a healthy menstrual cycle is a menstrual cycle in which ovulation occurred. And if ovulation is occurring regularly, then a menstrual cycle counting from day one of a bleed to day one of the next bleed should occur every 21 days up to every 35 days for an adult up to every 45 days for a teenager. So the one thing to make very clear is a menstrual cycle does not have to be 28 days. In fact, most women don't have a 28 day menstrual cycle. With a healthy menstrual cycle, it should fall within that date range of 21 days to every 45 days. And if ovulation has occurred, then the bleeding itself, when it comes two weeks after ovulation, will be no longer than seven days. It'll usually be between two to seven days. And it should be no more than about 80 milliliters in total of menstrual fluid lost over all the days of the bleeding. And so that looks like about four or five tablespoons in total. The other thing that defines a healthy menstrual cycle is it should be essentially symptom-free. We have this narrative that periods should be difficult in some way, but that is just not the case. If everything is going well, then the menstrual cycle should just arrive with no significant premenstrual symptoms, not too heavy, and not painful. Period pain is common, but it's not normal. And debilitating period pain is never, ever normal. So let's talk about some of these things that would be considered abnormal, that that a lot of women, you know, just live with or deal with and kind of see it as normal for them. Starting with pain, tell me what kind of ways can pain present for women during their cycle and what are some of the main causes? Menstrual pain is never normal, but it's pretty common to have a bit of cramping on the first day or two of the bleeding. And by a bit of cramping, I mean... The kind of discomfort that you can take one Nurofen and it it goes away. You know, it's okay. That's the sort of level of pain. And you can still go about your, your day. That amount of pain is the effect of something called prostaglandins, which are part of the immune system. It's sort of a, a type of inflammation that 
happens around the shedding of the uterine lining. And it doesn't mean anything sinister is going on. It's all pretty normal. That said, when when the body is healthy, the level of prostaglandins should be low enough that women don't experience pain. For most women, that involves avoiding cow's dairy products. I'll just say to the listener that if they have felt that some period pain is the normal for them, is just try you know, some simple changes such as eliminating cow's dairy or taking zinc. And you might be surprised to find that periods become painless. The first type of pain I refer to in my book as so-called normal period pain or common period pain is due to prostaglandins. Normal period pain responds easily to a Nurofen or a hot water bottle and shouldn't last more than a day or two. More severe period pain is the type of pain that interferes with a woman's life where she can't go to work or she can't go to school or she's curled up on the floor in a ball feeling nauseated and can't get any relief from a standard painkiller like Nurofen. That more severe period pain is usually a sign that something else is going on, something like, for example, endometriosis. So it means there's a pathology happening, a disease state essentially in the pelvis that is contributing to the pain. It's not just an expression of the prostaglandins that occur as part of the shedding of the uterine lining. It's really important that women know that debilitating period pain is never normal because very often the conditions that cause serious period pain, severe period pain, such as endometriosis, very often those conditions run in families. So girls might just be told, well, that's how it is. You know, that's how your mother was. That's how your sisters were. That's how your aunties were. And they're just led to expect that they should, this is the kind of thing they have to put up with. But that, so that's why some of the activism around endometriosis is so important to raise awareness that that is never normal and debilitating period pain is something that requires treatment. An interesting thing about the menstrual cycle is it takes about 12 years to mature that. So that means the communication between the brain and the ovaries takes 12 years to calibrate, which, for example, if a girl gets her period for the first time at 13, it's not until she's 25 that she is fully in the groove of having a regular ovulation, making a good amount of progesterone with that ovulation having that phase between ovulation and the period, a strong, you know, 14 days, luteal phase. And if a woman is not given the opportunity to mature her menstrual cycle because of, for example, being put on the pill at a young age, she will, when she comes off contraceptive drugs, have to pick up where she left off and resume that process of calibrating or maturing the menstrual cycle. And that's why it's not uncommon if a woman has been on the pill since she was young and then comes off in her 30s that she'll find that her menstrual cycles don't immediately start up. It can sometimes actually take a year or two to really get going. And even then, when they first get going, she might have lower levels of progesterone than might be expected. And it, it's, it's really just all about that maturation of the menstrual cycle. And then what happens when a young woman has irregular menstrual cycles and then they're put on the oral contraceptive pill? So there was never a medical reason to bleed monthly on the pill because a pill bleed is not a menstrual cycle. And so the only reason to give contraceptive drugs to address the problem of irregular cycles is either one, to give a false reassurance that women are having a monthly bleed, which has no purpose, or to prevent the abnormal thickening of the uterine lining that can occur with long-term anovulatory bleeds. So the second reason is valid in that if ovulation is not occurring regularly, if the uterine lining is thickening, then something has to be done. But that something does not have to be a fake period every month on contraceptive drugs. That serves no purpose. And through my lens, I feel like if we can start to use the correct words for things, that itself will create a change in women's health. Because the misunderstanding that pill bleeds are real periods has lots of downstream negative effects. So it's certainly, I think it has a negative effect for women themselves when they believe that by taking the pill, they've corrected something with their health. 
when in fact they've just masked the problem and are not having real periods. And the other negative downstream effect from calling pill bleeds periods is that we start to get this weird messaging from scientists and doctors that women don't need periods. And what they're really talking about is that women don't need monthly pill bleeds, which is 100% true. But what that's not acknowledging is that women do require a regular natural menstrual cycle, an ovulatory cycle, to make hormones. Have you listened to season one of The Shift? If you're enjoying this conversation, you'll love season one, where we deep dive into the field of gut health with 24 of the world leaders in this area. Once you're done, head back to your podcast app and find episode one. It's a great place to start. Tell me, what is your overall opinion on the oral contraceptive pill? The pill is chemical castration. There's really no other way to look at it. The contraceptive drugs in the pill are dosed such that they shut down ovarian function almost completely. They induce a chemically induced temporary menopause. If you try to measure hormones when a woman's on the pill, she has none. Her estrogen and progesterone are in the menopausal range. And those hormones are being replaced by contraceptive drugs, which are not the same as our own estradiol, which is our main estrogen and We're not the same as our own progesterone, have some of the same effects, but have also many opposite effects. And so that loss of ovarian hormones while on the pill is why women on the pill have altered brain structure compared to women who cycle naturally, have less healthy bones because they're not able to build bone density the way they would if they had estrogen and progesterone from natural menstrual cycles. And also another just example of that is women on the pill can develop vaginal dryness, loss of libido and changes, shrinking of the clitoris, which is concerning and sad, that is not dissimilar to changes that happen with menopause. So in the simplest terms, I would say that contraceptive drugs rob women of their own hormones. And some do that more strongly than others. The Depo-Provera shot is the contraceptive drug that suppresses hormones most strongly. It's associated with the strongest, kind of the worsened outcome for bone health, for example. After that would be the combined oral contraceptive pill, suppresses hormones and ovarian function pretty completely. And then after that would be the implants which do allow some estrogen. So with the contraceptive implants, they don't suppress ovarian function to the same extent as the pill or the injection. They allow some estrogen, but really no ovulation or progesterone. So they allow anovulatory cycling. The type of hormonal birth control that is the least suppressive to ovarian function is the hormonal IUD, which doesn't always suppress ovulation. It often does in the first 12 months when the dose of the contraceptive drug levonorgestrel is higher. But then as the dose lessens, there's less of a systemic effect and women can ovulate on the hormonal IUD, which is why I would argue that it's the hormonal IUD is the least problematic of the contraceptive drugs because it allows cycling and real hormones to be made. The interesting thing about the hormonal IUD is that it doesn't suppress ovulation. So here's a compare and contrast. With the pill, women bleed, but don't cycle, as in they have a pill bleed, a withdrawal bleed, but not a menstrual cycle because they're not ovulating. So with the pill, women bleed, but don't cycle. With the hormonal IUD, women can cycle, but not bleed. With the hormonal IUD, women can cycle in that they can still ovulate and have a essentially normal mens- hormonal menstrual cycle, but not see a bleed as part of that because of the local suppressive effect to the uterine lining. So it's actually quite an interesting <laughs> situation. Not that, I, not that I love the hormonal IUD. I mean, I think there's, there's often better options for both for avoiding pregnancy and for treating symptoms. But in terms of the argument of, you know, do women need periods or if women are in a situation where they'd like to get rid of their periods, 
the least invasive way to do that, really, or the least problematic way from the point of view of the hormonal system is a hormonal IUD because it can permit normal hormone cycling. Can you talk much about the hormonal contraception and moods, people experiencing anxiety and depression? Because this is something that we see a lot at shift is where a woman's getting, you know, a side effect from a drug and then ends up on antidepressants and then ends up, you know, having all this counselling, stops the oral contraceptive and all of a sudden this is just a completely different person. And obviously that doesn't happen for everyone, but what have you observed in your clinical practice or what does the research show around that? Contraceptive drugs of any type can have mood side effects. And for decades, women have been saying this, and clinicians have been observing it, that women can experience depression and anxiety from the pill, from the implant, (laughs) from the hormonal LED. And unfortunately, especially with regard to the pill, we've also had decades of doctors saying, no, that's not possible. I think the time has definitely come where we can say with confidence, contraceptive drugs can cause mood side effects. And Doctors need to start being alert to that because it is a common story. I've seen it with my patients for decades where women, especially young women, start the pill and then end up on an antidepressant within the next nine to 12 months and often are not connecting the two things. And it makes sense if it's a teenager, you know, there's lots of changes going on. Someone might not you know, be savvy enough to say, wait, could this be the pill that you started six or nine months ago? Could that be affecting your mood? But I think the more women talk about it, the information will get out there and hopefully doctors will start to connect the dots and maybe be able to, rather than prescribing another drug, an antidepressant on top of the pill, be able to say, well, you know, maybe it's worth switching to a non-hormonal method of contraception for a while to see if that improves your mood. I have so many stories from my own patients about how coming off the pill lifted their mood. One of my favorite ones was a young woman in her 20s who'd been on the pill since she was in her early teens, as is not unusual. And she finally stopped it. And what she said to me was that it was like a curse was lifted. Other phrases I've heard is, you know, I've come back to myself. All the color has come back into the world. And I hear these same stories all the time and I've got goosebumps right now because I I think the crux of it is, is that it's the awareness, right? It's not like we need to have nobody taking the oral contraceptive pill. There's a role for it and and there's a place. But if women aren't aware of some of the things that may happen, they just think that it's a coincidence. You know, there's not even a thought given to it that, hold on a minute, I've been perfectly fine and feeling really emotional, stable my entire life. And for the last 12 months, I've been a totally different person, right? And then you second guess yourself and there's all of that emotional baggage that comes with it. So there's a massive piece on education for this, for doctors, but also for the general public. Yeah. And it's in general, I think, yeah, we're educated to blame ourselves for things. You know, if it's something, especially around mood, it's like, well, it must be something wrong with me. You know, it has to just be something wrong with my brain, not necessarily going, you know, what, what else is happening? What, what, you know, could it be this drug that's making me feel the way I do? So, you know, I think my conversations with young women waking up from the pill, you know, feeling the curse lifted as the contraceptive drugs leave their lives and they feel their emotional vitality come back. That's one of the the moments where, you know, young women are kind of waking up to, not just young women, but women are waking up to what's been going on. The other one where I hear a lot of interesting stories is when women realize or learn for the first time that the pill that they've been given to regulate their cycles can't actually do that. You know, those are the conversations where I do hear from women some sense of betrayal that, you know, it's a drug they've been taking for 10 or 15 years to regulate their cycle could never actually do that and was, for all extents and purposes, really worsening the underlying problem that was causing their irregular cycles in the first place. That would be the case for PCOS, that it masks contraceptive drugs by giving a regular fake period, mask the problem of PCOS, mask the irregular periods, but worsen the underlying driver of the problem, which is usually insulin resistance. 
I would love for you to describe from your lens what PCOS is and sort of how you see that coming across with women. So after the doctor has ruled out all possible reasons for losing a period, such as thyroid, prolactin, gluten, then often at the end of the day, irregular periods or lack of periods comes down to either PCOS or hypothalamic amenorrhea, also known as undereating. Those are the two most common explanations for irregular periods or no periods in younger women. There's also the possibility of menopause or early menopause, which the doctor can easily rule out with a blood test. If that's been ruled out, then we're left with the two most common PCOS or hypothalamic amenorrhea. Now, I mentioned those two together because they have a few similarities, which means that they're sometimes misdiagnosed one for the other. And also they have enough differences that the treatment is completely opposite. The PCOS is, despite the name polycystic ovary, is nothing to do with cysts on the ovaries, like absolutely zero to do with cysts on the ovaries. It's actually the situation of a miscalibration between the brain, the pituitary and the the hypothalamus and the ovaries. So the communication is happening in a way that ovulation is not occurring regularly. And there is an overproduction of androgens or male hormones. That's the crux of PCOS. That's the center of it. It's about high male hormones and usually irregular ovulation resulting in irregular bleeds and ovulatory cycles or no cycles at all. The so-called cysts that are being referred to in the polycystic ovary finding are really just follicles or eggs, which are normal for the ovary and will change every month. So you could have quite a number of follicles, one cycle, but then they'll be reabsorbed and new ones made. So your ovaries could look totally different. That's why I I really, with my own patients and in my writing, try to direct people's attention away from that ultrasound finding because it's very confusing because it doesn't diagnose the condition of polycystic ovary syndrome. And likewise, the ultrasound finding of polycystic ovaries is so common that it can occur with anyone, including with women who have hypothalamic amenorrhea or under eating, which is why a very common situation currently is for young women with under eating so-called hypothalamic amenorrhea, to be misdiagnosed as having PCOS because they have polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. Both conditions can present with irregular cycles or no cycles. Both can present with polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. The difference is that PCOS usually has much stronger symptoms of androgens or male hormones such as facial hair or jawline acne or breakouts, whereas hypothalamic amenorrhea can have a small amount of breakouts or facial hair, but not significant. And then from that point, they start to look very different because PCOS is either associated with normal body weight or overweight or normal insulin or insulin resistance, whereas hypothalamic amenorrhea is associated with undereating, low fasting insulin on a blood test. The treatment for the two conditions is very different in that PCOS often may have to do some degree of altering the diet to perhaps avoid high sugary desserts to reverse insulin resistance, whereas hypothalamic amenorrhea, the main treatment is to eat way, way more to recover from hypothalamic amenorrhea and get your period back. And that can take six months. I guess it's worth having a conversation about over-exercising as well when we're talking about under-eating and that conversation because time and time again, especially I've had a lot of women who are really into CrossFit and HIT, you know, and with those kind of programs, often they have challenges where they're reducing calories and their thyroid goes offline, their hormones go offline. Is that something that you're seeing more of recently as well? Yes, There's definitely been an uptick in women not eating enough to fuel their hormonal system. And it does affect all hormonal systems. It it does affect ultimately thyroid health, but the menstrual cycle is the most sensitive of the hormonal systems, especially when it comes to under eating. So women can be active, they can exercise, but they just need to know they need to eat way more (laughs) to keep up with that. And one of the things that happens with female athletes is that 
Unfortunately, our appetite doesn't always tell us how much food we need. I think, you know, exercise itself can be a bit of an appetite suppressant. So for anyone who's exercising or, you know, training strongly, regularly, you really need to get down and do some calculations or get a dietitian or nutritionist or a naturopath to help you do those calculations of how many calories you're going to need to keep up with that. And your period can be a handy gauge because ovulation will be the first thing to switch off with under eating. Losing your period to under eating is not a malfunction. It's the brain doing exactly what it's supposed to do, which is to not attempt to make a baby when there's not enough food to make a baby. And more likely to happen with younger women who have a less mature menstrual cycle. Older women can sometimes get away with exercising a bit more or start eating, you know, eating a bit less and still holding on to their menstrual cycle. Want to look deeper into your own health? Our virtual naturopathic team help people all over the world to shift their health and their lives. We offer a 90-minute online discovery and diagnostic session where you can find out where you're at, why things are happening, and what you need to do about it. Everyone is an individual, and sometimes it can help to have someone break down your journey and see where you need to head next. To find out more, go to theshiftclinic.com and click on clinic. So endometriosis is something we're seeing more and more of. Can you tell me what you're observing in your clinical practice and what the research is leaning towards when it comes to the causes and why so many women are getting this condition? Endometriosis is not a hormonal condition. It's not a period problem, although it manifests with period symptoms, but fundamentally endometriosis is an inflammatory disease in the same category as diseases of immune dysfunction like inflammatory arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease, which is why, you know, trying to treat endometriosis with contraceptive drugs has been such a dead end <laughs> because they can't, they can sometimes suppress the disease process to some extent, but hormonal birth control in no way does anything to correct the underlying disease process of endometriosis. It's an inflammatory disease that has a, quite a strong genetic component, which is why endometriosis runs in families. Some women would just never get endometriosis, even if everything else went wrong, you know, with their pelvic microbiome, you know, their high estrogen, even if everything was stacked against them, they would still never get the disease because they don't have that genetic tendency. So it's very much that kind of condition. Endometriosis is an inflammatory disease with an epigenetic component, which means you know, certain genes probably in the immune system have been switched on in you know, previous generations due to exposure to environmental toxins such as dioxin. And then when that dysfunctional pelvic immune system meets a problem with the pelvic microbiome, which seems to be what's emerging as a, a major factor in endometriosis, the result is an active inflammatory disease process in the pelvis, but it can, endometriosis can actually occur outside of the pelvis, but usually in the pelvis, that are active inflammatory lesions that invade tissue, create a, a nerve supply that can create quite a lot of pain and scar tissue. It's a terrible disease. It's a devastating disease. And the way forward with endometriosis, I think is a complete, you know, back to the drawing board for medicine. This strategy of cutting it out and then kind of hoping for the best with contraceptive drugs is not working for a lot of women. Sometimes surgery done properly, it's what they call excision surgery. If you get lucky enough to remove all of the endometriosis lesions, that can have a good outcome. Certainly that can mean the disease process can be put in remission, sometimes forever, at least you know, for a longer term. That's good when that can happen. But for a lot of women, the surgery doesn't fix the problem of endometriosis because the lesions just grow back. You know, if, if the inflammation, if the immune dysfunction of the disease is not addressed, then you just get the disease coming back. So it's almost like they go in, do the surgery, but the factors that caused it are still there. So therefore there's this really high recurrence rate for women. With properly done surgery for endometriosis, the recurrence rate is only about 50% only 50%, you know, which does mean at least 50% of women, you can get good long-term outcomes from surgery, but 
The problem is what we really don't want to see happen is women having surgery after surgery, endometriosis, because everyone agrees that is not a good outcome because the surgery itself can cause scar tissue adhesions that can contribute to pelvic pain. So, you know, maybe one properly done surgery. And then if that's not working, there there has to be another strategy. From a naturopathic perspective, the main strategy for endometriosis is to treat the immune dysfunction that lies at the heart of the disease. That's fortunately now starting to become a bit more clear from the research that there are some very specific, very unusual things going on with the immune system, that there's some very unusual things going on with the microbiome with this disease. Specifically, what we're seeing is very high levels of gram-negative bacteria or E. coli in the pelvis, not in the intestine. Well, in the intestine, obviously, that's where they're starting, but they potentially translocating from the gut into the pelvis. And when that lipopolysaccharide or gram-negative bacteria is in the pelvis together with estrogen, together with the genetic and the epigenetic immune dysfunction, that's the perfect storm for these lesions, endometriosis lesions to get going and cause pain. And so what the research is showing is the presence of the gram-negative bacteria, potentially the importance. There was a pretty interesting animal study that came out in, I think, 2018 that found that giving a certain type of antibiotic, one that you know, it was effective against that strain of bacteria dramatically reduced the size of endometriosis lesions in animals. Now that has not been translated into human trials at this stage. And so certainly there's no doctor that's going to prescribe an antibiotic for endometriosis at this stage, but I suspect that's the future of treatment for this, for endometriosis. For years as a clinician, I've been treating endometriosis with antimicrobial herbal medicines that are aimed at For example, like a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or a SIBO situation, which is extremely common with endometriosis, that overgrowth of the gram-negative bacteria in the small intestine, potentially translocating to the pelvis. And if you can knock back the levels of those bacteria, you can make inroads into reducing pain, dialing down that inflammatory response. There's always going to then need to be some kind of maintenance situation in place, which involves ticking all the boxes to keep the immune system happy and the immune system not in an active inflammatory state. So what I would love to ask you about lastly is about menopause and perimenopause and you know why you're really passionate about this area of, the, of work, why you've written your book and yeah, anything else you would love to speak to around that. So I'm very passionate about perimenopause and menopause because I've just written a book on it, because I'm in it myself, I may have may or may not have had my final period. I'm not sure yet. I mean, that it's like a waiting room after the final period until one achieves menopause or graduates to menopause. The thing that I'm excited about, about menopause is that I am now completely convinced that it's a normal, natural state and not just the accident of living too long. We've Again, we've had this narrative that, you know, everyone used to die by 45 and therefore, you know, menopause is just you know, it's kind of because you've lived too long and so therefore you've outlived your ovaries. What the research shows now is that that's definitely not the case. In fact, through the lens of evolutionary biology, menopause is something that we've adapted to have. In fact, what the research seems to suggest is that human longevity itself developed so that women could live, you know, two or three decades after their final reproduction. So we've got this this state of post-reproductive vitality that was very important for ancestral humans, which to me is just fascinating. And it, it just infuses the whole process with a lot more meaning. I think the shift to menopause is a, is a natural state. It should be inherently healthy. The fact that we experience symptoms with menopause is potentially a mismatch between our modern lifestyle and our physiology as it evolved to be. So one of the things that happens with menopause is we lose the higher reproductive amounts of estrogen and progesterone as we do shift to more of a tendency to insulin resistance, which can have a big impact on symptoms of menopause and also long-term outcomes. So one of the most important hormones actually through all of a woman's life is insulin and sensitivity to insulin. But during our reproductive years, having a healthy sensitivity to insulin, having 
Insulin levels that are not too high can support healthy, regular ovulation. And then with menopause, having a healthy insulin sensitivity can help to prevent menopausal symptoms to some extent, and also some of the you know, longer term outcomes in terms of cardiovascular health that can be associated with menopause. Interesting. And how do you think the landscape of women's health treatment will change in the mainstream over the next kind of 10 years or so? I predict that future generations will look back on the era of contraceptive drugs as a very strange time. I hope that we do collectively start to value women's hormones more than we do now. And that will mean valuing ovulation, valuing regular ovulatory cycling for women, especially for young women, for bone health, for mood, for all the reasons. And once that starts to happen, once medicine and science starts to see ovulation for the asset that it is, that's going to open up, I hope, a lot of new research into ways that we can treat, you know, and relieve conditions, including endometriosis, ways that we can treat that, those conditions without suppressing ovulation. One last question for you, Lara. If you could give just one piece of advice to someone that wanted to make a shift in their health, what would it be? Well, for women, it can be a game changer to not take contraceptive drugs. I think, you know, at least consider what your health would be like without hormonal birth control. Bigger picture, the advice that's pretty central to my book that guides me with my patients is to trust your body. I think all of us, in our society, but especially women, are taught to fear our bodies, you know, to, to feel like that we're broken in some way. I, I sometimes hear that, you know, women might be thinking, okay, that's all nice and well to say that, you know, the menstrual cycle is healthy and I'm sure some women can do it, but I can't because I'm broken in some way. My experience with literally thousands of women, with my own patients and with my readers over the years, your body knows what to do. In almost in many cases, almost every case, there is a way forward. The, the body wants to ovulate. It wants to have symptomless regular periods. And you can usually get there given half the chance. So I think I finished my book with your body wants to be healthy. It wants to have healthy periods. Treat the cause and play the long game. Stick with your treatment and trust your body. I love it. Lara Bryden, thank you so much for your amazing expertise. I can't wait to see what you do next. And I'm really excited about the work that you're doing for so many women. There was so much amazing information in this episode. So let's make sure we've gotten the key points and what action you can take as a result of this. Women who have more natural ovulatory menstrual cycles live longer. This means that if you're not getting your period regularly or on birth control for big chunks of time, it can impact your long-term health. Knowing this, we need to decide if the risk of contraceptives outweigh the benefits and actively work to correct our cycles if they are absent or irregular. If you didn't catch Jolene Brighton's conversation on the oral contraceptive pill, I'd recommend going back to episode two of the expert series and checking that one out. Your menstrual cycle should be symptom-free. Now, if you've listened to season two of The Shift, then you probably get this by now, but I can't stress this enough. Period pain is not normal. PMS is not normal. We should not be feeling terrible leading up to our periods, period. Menopause is a normal natural state and not a disease. We get symptoms because often by the time this occurs, our physiology, meaning the processes in our body, can't keep up with our lifestyle of stress, nutritional depletion and burnout. We cover this in more detail in the menopause episode of season two. Learning is great, but action is better. Here are a few things you could do as a result of this conversation in order to help you shift your health and your life. The most important thing that you can do for yourself if your menstrual cycle is out of whack is to seek professional help to bring it back into balance. Your period is your fifth vital sign and it's really important that we address any hormonal issues. Naturopathy is an excellent modality for this, but also acupuncture and perhaps a functional medicine practitioner could help. 
Our team works with this every day, so reach out if you need support. Research what can throw hormones out of whack. The biggest ones are stress, insulin resistance and environmental toxicity. More on these topics in Season 2 of The Shift. Given the period is the fifth vital sign of health, start tracking it and seeing what symptoms show up for you. If something is new or getting worse, seek help. A huge thank you to Lara Bryden for sharing her amazing knowledge with us all on The Shift. If you like this episode, please let us know by sharing on social media and tagging Lara and myself, Catherine Maslin, or The Shift Clinic so that we can hear what you have to say. You can find out more about Lara on her website, larabryden.com. That's L-A-R-A-B-R-I-D-E-N.com or say hello on Instagram. In the next episode of the Shift Expert series, we have Dr. Robin Murphy, a naturopathic doctor that works in women's health with a specialty in genetic abnormalities. You do not want to miss this one. Coming up on The Shift. When we talk about nutrigenomics, we're talking about what are the nutritional compounds found in foods that will influence our genes. There's a classic saying that, you know, your genes load the gun and the environment fires it. The mind is an incredible tool that has the ability to completely sabotage your health as well as transform it. This series is a production of The Shift Clinic. Hosted by Catherine Maslin. Music and sound design by Shade Furlong. Thank you to all of our experts. For more details on them, go to theshiftclinic.com. We can be. We must be. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequality. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how we will get it done. The Global Goals. A 15 year plan for everyone, everywhere. everywhere. With no one left behind. The Global Goals are a framework that collectively help us support the health of our people and the planet. At At Shift, Shift, we are ambassadors for the Global Goals. This project supports Global Goal number six. Clean water and sanitation. Every time you listen to an episode of The Shift, we provide a day's access to clean water for a human in need in Malawi, Africa. Water Water is the the foundation foundation to health, and and we we believe every human should have access to clean, healthy water. So please share this podcast wide and and keep keep tuning in. in so we can impact those who need it the most.